All right, welcome everybody to this week's uh, episode of the Beyond Wall Street podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Nathan Bowers here. I'm with uh, Brandon Nieves. If you want to say hi, Brandon. Hello. Hi, hi everyone. How's everybody doing? Got some Hopefully. good material here for you guys. Absolutely. Hopefully really well today. So what we're doing today is we are going to do an illustration comparison between all the popular investment vehicles that are out there. We're starting off with $1 million dollars at age 65, how each of these accounts, a 401k, a Roth IRA, and an MPI account would deal with projecting that money out and for how many years will it last? How much will you be able to take out with said just one account over how long of a time? Fees, taxes, we'll mention a whole nine yards about it. So without further ado, um, this is going to basically just show you how to diversify your investment portfolio and what you could be missing out on to, um, you know, strengthen your overall um, scope of retirement and what retirement will look like for you. So, um, Brand, do you have anything to add before we get started here? Uh, no, no, I think uh, we just go, let's go right into the numbers and this way uh, people can see uh, the reason, the reasoning behind, behind those numbers and then we'll go from there. All right, I'm going to make you the host now. And you're welcome to share your screen and get started. All right. Okay. So, so the first thing I uh, wanted to take a look at is, wanted to just let everybody, you know, what does it take to actually become a millionaire? And what I mean by millionaire is, how long would it take you to actually accumulate just $1 million? So I just want to give a quick example of this because I think it kind of brings us to the point. Because a million dollars, they say, is fundamental. That should be the critical mass that everyone should strive to accumulate, at least on a minimum level, uh, to maintain some type of residual income. Now, the big question is, where is that residual income going to be coming from? Will it be coming from the taxable environment or the tax deferred or the tax free? Now, here we're just going to look at just the critical mass. So let's say you got a 50 year old and let's say um, let me go ahead and just restart this and let's refresh. OK, well, let's do this this way. Right so let's say 50 years old, your target age, OK, 70. Uh, amount currently invested, let's say you're starting with a $50,000 uh, face amount or accumulation amount. Savings per month, $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year. Let's look at expected rate of return of three with inflation, a 6% expected uh, return and inflation at 3%. So we're going to calculate that and we're going to see what that's going to look like. So basically what this is showing us here is if you were, if you started with 50,000 and you put $1,000 a month away, it would actually at age 70, you would have $616,000. So to get to a millionaire status, you'd have to work at least until age 77 if you're going to continue to do what you're doing. So a couple things, change your monthly amount. Instead of doing 1,000 a month, do 1,800. And 43 a month. Change your current amount invested to 169,732. In other words, instead of starting with 50, start with 170, or just get a higher return. You'd have to get about a 9.58% return if you were going to invest $12,000 a year at age 50 to become a millionaire by age 70. So this was just, you know, bringing the point across this is how you do it. Now, you could always put uh, different amounts, different ages, but this is, you know, a person putting away $12,000 a year, you could think, well, that's a lot. Well, right. if you have an average return of about, you know, 6%, uh, you're going to get about $616,000. So you really got to get a higher return or invest more. Let's get into the illustrations because I think that there's a lot of, a lot of people focus a lot, a lot of times on the account value. Even advisors focus on account value. So let's say you got a million dollars, 865, and we're going to use a, let's see, 28% tax bracket uh, with an investment yield of 7%. If you withdraw, now the idea is most people think, well, if I 
if, if I have a million dollars and I have to want to live on 70 and I'm earning seven, I could just live off the interest and my principal will be preserved. They call that conservation. Well, in this case, that's not going to happen because your money was accumulated in the wrong account. And what I mean by wrong account is you did a good job of accumulating that money over the years, but now when you go to start taking income, you're not going to take your 70,000. You got to withdraw 97,222 just to net 70,000. And if you did that, now you would run out of money in 14 years. You're out of cash. This is the trajectory that all Americans are going to fall into because most Americans are putting all their retirement money or all future money into these tax deferred accounts. There's nothing wrong with a tax deferred account. They're good accumulation vehicles. They're just not engineered, nor were they ever intended to be distribution vehicles. And this is, this is also including the average rate of return. So you're seeing it's not actually on the left side going down by 70, thousand dollars each year it's you know forty nine thousand the first year just to point out to everybody and another thing to keep in mind as he's just hitting on that tax note look at this cumulative income tax paid column yeah. at the end of it you will have paid three hundred and eighty seven hundred thousand all right maybe excuse me words are hard three hundred eighty seven thousand dollars yeah. In income tax. And that's without the fees. That's without RMDs that we, this is, I Correct. bet, you know, yeah. once, once that kicks in at, uh, you know, age 72, there 21,000 from the RMD, it's just going to bring this out quicker. Just insane. Just the lack of just um, awareness that, you know, these financial professionals, you know, you go to work, you know, oh, we offer a 401k, 403b, and you know nothing about it. Like, cool, that's my retirement fund. And then no idea how it works. And then you say you do get to a million dollars. And this is, you know, 14 years, 70,000. If you have a million dollars, I don't tell you where you're going, what you're projected to be at age 65. So those are the questions. Again, we always hammer home. Hey, yeah. you have to ask, hey, where am I going to be at 65? How much is this account projected to be at and plan based off that. So right. we'll right, right back into it, Brandon, just add bits and pieces as they come. So. Yeah, exactly. No, that's a good observation because if you think about it, I mean, that's, that's the cost. It just for you to put away, actually just for you to put into your pocket, 995,577, you had to lose 387,169, just like Nathan said. So theoretically, what you had to really do is you had to pull out $1.3 million out of an account that just had a, had a million dollars. But because a million dollars was earning interest, you had to take more from the interest than the principal. So that's why you ran out of money because you're in the negative 1.3 million. See, that's the negative. You went below what you actually accumulated. And how long did it take you to accumulate a million dollars? You see, so, and this was, uh, did not even include fees or anything on this. This is just- Or, or the market down. risk too, a down or year. Or market down risk, year. yeah. We didn't even show any deviations in that. This is straight up taking income out. And this is why for all the years I've been doing this, and you know, when you're working on the investment side, it's true. We focus so much on building the account, getting the best allocation model. You know, uh, we, we pride ourselves on that, but- I, you know, I, we kept running simulation after simulation. And every, kind, every time I did a simulation, when I started taking the income stream, once I applied the tax, uh, tax rate to that income, the investment fell apart. It always fell apart. So we wouldn't show. So a lot of advisors won't even show the income stream. Or when they do show the income stream, they include Social Security on the income stream. And that creates a false illusion, illusion because you're actually thinking, oh, that's coming from my 401k. No, it's not. They're, they're using a distribution from your 401k mm -hmm. and they're including social security on top of that. And I believe that makes oh. your um, social security become more taxable or, or taxable. Which one of those? I, I forget. Well, there's different thresholds and it depends if you're single, if you're married. So let's say if you're married and you file your, your taxes jointly, the thresholds are 32,000 and 44,000. So if you're a married couple 
and your income that's coming out now, there's something they, they, they call it provisional income. It's the calculation that's used to determine how much of your social security is gonna be taxable. So they, they look at five things. They look at any interest you're earning from any outside investments, okay? They look at part-time employment. They look at half of your social security. So let's say you're gonna get uh, $30,000 from social security. 15,000 is already included in the calculation. So they're already taking 15 grand of that. Now, if you're earning any interest from any investments, rental property, once that number starts to creep up, and as you can see here, if you actually had to take out $70,000, if that's, that was your net income that year, now you just made your social security taxed by 85% because your 70,000 passed the threshold of 44,000. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if it's 32,000, but below 44,000, your social security, uh, your social security will be taxed up to 50. But if it's above 44, you're going to be taxed up to 85. And a lot of people don't even know that. And then also too, RMDs, you throw RMDs into the mix, you know, now you got yourself another issue. Explain because to everybody what the RMD is, because this will probably throw a lot of people off and they probably don't know about the RMDs. Tell, explain yeah. that out just really quick, 30 seconds. Yeah, so RMD is basically a required minimum distributions because when you get a qualified plan, Uncle Sam is a partner in that plan because he's giving you a tax deduction on the money that you're contributing. So you're getting a, a, basically a tax incentive on that. So over time, he's also allowing your money to compound and grow. So because he's never taxed at this income and your contribution lowered your taxable income every single year that you were contributing, Uncle Sam wants to make sure he's going to get his cut. So they put in this rule, it used to be 70 and a half, now it's 72. They, they, they manned that in there because they want to tax the money before you pass away. So that's why they started at age 72. So mm -hmm. if you don't take out the required minimum distribution, you're hit with a 50% tax penalty. So all these retirement accounts, they're government sponsored. Uh, they tell you how much you could put in. They can tell, they tell you when you could tap into the funds. And then they tell you when you better tap into funds. And every single direction that you look, you're going to be penalized one way or another. And even if you do everything right, the biggest penalty of all is they're just going to tax that income at ordinary income tax rates. And they're going to do that based on whatever the percentage is at the time you go to withdraw those funds. Absolutely. So that's going to be very problematic. Let me bring up a couple things really quick. I, um, first thing, uh, I had a conversation with... Uh, uh, a family member, we'll just say a couple, yeah, I think it was yesterday or the day before, and she brought up, um, it was with our first episode of the podcast reviewing it, and um, and I was very, was very proud that she actually brought this up because she's saying, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to, uh, you know, invest with a 401k or, or I don't want the government to have any say in it because, you know, they manipulate it and they change the rules, you know, yeah. and it's not to say that's a negative thing. But her point of concern she brought up, I thought was very, very valid just because if this is your only investment vehicle, like we talked on the first episode of the podcast, those tax brackets are subject to change whenever. And with the current situation, they could be rather drastically. So having this as one leg of, you know, just, just the only leg to stand on, you know, we're seeing in 14 years you know, 15 years, because you get 21,000 that 15th year. So I guess we'll say 15 years. But if you're living past 79, you're taking a pay cut from 70,000 a year plus Social Security, just to Social Security. And if you're living, you know, a good retired lifestyle, you're going you know, to the poorhouse, essentially, after 14 years. And, you know, you're like, yeah. hey, if could have, would have, should have back in the day, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. this, the second thing I want to say just real fast is let's just mm -hmm. say a scenario. I'm this, I'm this account holder. I passed away at age 72. There's $599,000 in that account. What happens for to my, does it go straight to my beneficiary? Does it go to my estate and have to clear that first? Explain that out. Cause that's, um, that's a question I get asked a lot. If I pass away, it just goes straight to my wife. Right. Well, so you have to name a beneficiary. And if you don't have a named beneficiary, then it does go to directly to your estate. But for those that have a named beneficiary, one of the biggest problems is that a qualified plan can be one of the worst assets to leave behind. 
uh, to a beneficiary. I mean, if I mean, if it's all you're leaving behind, then that's definitely better than nothing. But here's the problem: the problem is, is that you now created an unintended consequence because now you just made somebody else a primary beneficiary, and they plan on taxing that. So, if you name your wife the beneficiary, as an example, let's say it's five hundred thousand that the four hundred one k account. That five hundred thousand, she's got two choices. One she can take the funds and turn it into an IRA and her own the account and then take out the RMDs on her um, you know, life expectancy. Or she can just become the beneficiary of the 401k and she could either just let it stay there. And then the RMDs are going to have to be taken out based on the deceases. Uh, age of when, whenever he to, whenever he turns age seventy two, that's when they're going to have to start, start taking that required minimum distribution. But either way you look at it, that five hundred thousand, either if it continues to grow, now she's going to be paying more money in taxes. So I, that five hundred thousand can very easily, after tax, turn into you know three hundred thirty thousand dollars when it's all said and done. So you just left all that money to the IRS. And so your family's not going to get all that 401k money. They're going to get very little of it. And, and, and right now, the, you know, the estate tax exemption, I know, is almost $12 million. But there was a time when it was only like $1.5 million. It can go right back to that very easily. Yeah, and it de- I think it depends it. on, especially with uh, the inflation and, you know, the current tax situation we brought up with the raise of income tax. If there's a yeah. taxable option out there with this debt, you know, the government's going to find it. Oh, yeah. They are. I mean, they need to find it. They need revenue. And the other thing is the SECURE Act. They changed the laws also, too, on uh, the stretch IRA. It used to be that if you are uh, non-spousal heir, so now, okay, the 401k goes to the wife, but if the wife passes away and she still has funds within that IRA account, now she leaves it to the kids, but now the kids yeah. used to, they could stretch it out. To, for their whole their life expectancy, but now they have to spend the entire account within 10 years. Doesn't matter when in 10 years, they just got to spend it in 10 years. That's That could be a problem because what if the kids are making really good income? Now they have to pull money out of this account, which jacks up their tax bracket, which now they're going to be paying more taxes on their total household income. So it's just, you know, there's just a lot of problems. It, the thing about it is that it just wasn't intended to be a distribution wealth transfer vehicle. It's just an accumulation account. It was designed to be a, a little appetizer on top of pensions and social security. And like I've said it before, now it's being served as the main course. So people need to know if you're going to invest in this thing, that's fine. But like I always say, put a careful prescribed amount of money because if you have a million dollars in this 401k at 872, the required minimum distributions can be staggering. And if it's more than a million dollars, they could put you in a, a you know a very high tax bracket. I mean, 97,000 could be the required minimum distribution on 1.5 million dollar account. Right. So there are ways to avoid that. There are ways to accumulate money and not have to worry about your Social Security being taxed or not have to pay these RMDs. Okay. Awesome. Well put. Uh, we got about 17 left here just to keep on pace with time. I want to uh, bring up one last point and then um, have your closing thoughts on this section. Then we'll move on to the next. Um, let's okay. just take current events. So right now, I believe, I don't know if it's, it went up at all today, but last time I looked we're about 10 and a half percent in the negative right now, folks, mm-hmm. keep in mind, say you're at that flat million dollars. So look at, let's look at the first year. Cause it's also what you just um, brought up today in our podcast too, Brandon, you take a negative 10% hit first year, right? A million dollars. How much is that? A hundred thousand dollars loss. They think, oh, and then now I'm withdrawing seventy thousand. So now you're one hundred and seventy thousand dollars down. Right. So now let's look at the second year. It goes back up ten percent. That doesn't cover your loss, does it? That doesn't sustain the account. How much do you need to cover that negative ten percent? As Brandon said today, you need twenty percent positive because you're ten in the negative. So that's something right. to think about too. Is you're a hundred percent exposed to the market risk. You know how different this projection is going to look if we lost. 10 and a half percent like we did, you know, this month right now, this year's tracking, 
you're out now you're down a hundred thousand dollars the first year because of the market run. so just keep that in mind and we'll move to the uh, closing statements about all this if you have anything to add before we move on brand no uh, so the solution to this is this if this is where you're going to put your money you, a, a million dollars is not going to cut it if you want to live on seventy thousand dollars a year look what you actually have to do you actually have to oh go back here there we go you actually have to accumulate 1.5 million. So $1 million to get 70,000 is not gonna cut it because you gotta withdraw more money to get the 70, right? Mm -hmm. So if you gotta withdraw 97,000 and that's 70 and you don't wanna run out of money, you need 1.5 million. That's how much you need. If you have 1.5 million, you take out 97,222, you net 70,000, this income is going to last you, well, it's going to last you past age 90. So there's your solution. So here's a here's a, the more behind the, the, the whole storyline here. If you're going to put money in a tax deferred account, and that's what you're going to do, and that's, that's it, you're doing it. Okay, no problem. But understand, accumulation is one skill set. Distribution is a completely other different skill set. It's completely different. I will tell you, accumulating money is a very easy thing. You pick out certain mutual funds, ETFs, boom, boom, you dollar cost average, you rebalance it once a year. You know, you keep on putting money in. The market's going to do well over time. But now you got all this money. And now you go to distribute that money. Now you got to pay the tax. And now you got to be fixated on what the market's going to do. Or here's the other thing. You're going to have to take your entire equity position and transfer it over into fixed accounts like bonds and money markets so that you're going to keep your, your principal safe, but now you're positioned to earn no returns mm -hmm. because you're out of the market. So it's either going to stay in the market or you're going to get out of the market, but either way, there's a problem with that. And there are solutions behind it. You know, there are things out there that can position you to be in the middle of that. And that's what Nathan and I are trying to, you know, expose and bring out. But this is the trajectory that you're going to have to be. You're going to have to save a lot more money if you're going to put money in a tax deferred account. And I cannot stress this enough. This is without showing any hits from the market, which we just yeah. came off, like you said, or like we brought up before in the last podcast, a 13 year bull run from 08. But if you have one, and 08 was crazy, but it's not the yeah. worst the market's ever been hit either. If you had one negative 38% hit on here, the mm -hmm. amount of damage that would, it would deflate this whole balloon in one yeah. year. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that's a good point. They say that um, the first 10 years of your distribution cycle, so the, for the first 10 years when you're starting to pull money out of, out of, an, out of an, an investment, that's the sweet spot. That's going to determine whatever happens in those 10 years is going to 80% of what happens in that time segment will determine how long that account's going to last. So in that 10 year period, if you're taking out more money because you got to net a certain amount and, and you're just, you all of a sudden found yourself in a high tax bracket that you were not in before. Again, like I always said, there's no restart button. It's what's done is done. The accounts that you have or the accounts that you have, you can't switch over. Oh, now let me jump into this other thing. No, it is what it is at that point. You're 68 years old, you're 70. Yep. You know, now you have what you have. So it, it's very important that if you still have time before you start taking money out, that you look to see what you have. And don't just look at the account value. Look at the account value on how it functions when you're pulling money out of the account. Because you got to take into account market deviations, and taxes. And with market deviations, if there's a negative drop in the market, all it takes is one nice drop in a 10 year period. Yep. And it's it's done. You're, you're gonna run out of cash. That's why they say, you know how much money they actually say, Nathan, to pull out of, uh, if you have a million dollars, they call it, the, the well, they call it a 4% rule. Uh, it's not even a rule, it's more like a mm -hmm. suggestion, but they ran all these Monte Carlo simulations and they look to see, you know, based on time horizons and based on having money in bonds and stocks, if you take out 4%, now they're saying 3%, yeah. it should last you 30 years. But the problem is they're using simulations based on when bond rates were doing re really well. Yeah. I mean, when yeah. bond rates were like doing like 7 8%. 
we're getting bond rates between three and four. So that strategy doesn't work, but let's just say it did. You got a million dollars, you're gonna live on 40 grand a year? Your 70 grand that you want is way too much. Not even 40, taxes. Yeah. Like 32, 28. Oh, well, like well you include taxes. Well, yeah. So if you, if you want 40,000, you're gonna have to pull out almost 52,000 for you to get 40,000. And now you're tapping into the principal at that point and you run in jeopardy of losing money very quickly. All it takes is one negative year because remember you're depleting the account just based on the fact that you're pulling money out. And because you got to pay the tax, that's a negative loss every single year. So that's a problem. So one solution would be this. What if you just... Let's just, um, let me take one second. I, I just, I'd love to bring this up because of how insanely important it is. We talk about 08 and you know, people talk about the market. So they'll go down and go back up and why you cannot have this risk while you're in that 10 year window, as you described, just thinking of the numbers, 38% negative. If you're this person withdrawing at 1.5 with the 97,000 you're taking out for your income, $700,000 one year, 38%. So I just took 40%, you know, a million, 400,000, half of that's 200,000 for the 557, 600,000 plus 97K. You're down 700K almost in the first year. Your income's going to go, now you have 900 and something thousand in this account. Your income stream just took a massive hit. You're going from 70K a year distribution, probably down to, Gosh, 40. Yeah. At last. And, and yeah, check this out, Nathan. Look at it in the 20th year. So, okay, if you got 1.5 million, okay, you, the, the income is going to last you. Again, this is not showing variable rates. This is showing a fixed linear rate. So let's, let's, let's get that straight. But we're just looking at cash flow. You might get your 70 grand, but just look over at age 84. You had to spend... Five hundred and fifty, five hundred and forty-four thousand four hundred and forty-four dollars, just to have put that income in your pocket. Up to that point, you had to spend over a half a million dollars in taxes. Listen, if you're okay with that, you know that's fine. Yeah, you got your income, but a half a million dollars you have to, you had to spend just to get that much income for the first twenty years of retirement. What happens if you go up? This is showing a tax bracket of 28%. What happens if you go up $1 and that $1 takes you from 28 to 32? Or maybe it's not 32, maybe they just change it up to 34. All it takes is $1 to go to the next tax bracket. And if that next tax bracket is high, remember, you know, we got what, seven tax brackets? It's uh, what, 10, 12, 24, uh, then it jumps up to 28, 32, 35, 20. and 37. Does it stop? Right. It? Isn't it 24, 28, 32, or is it 24? Right, yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, so that's right. 28, 32, 30, uh, 37. So yeah, put, the, put look that 4% in. Those. Look at that 4% from 24 to 28. What's what we just talked about? The 4% rule out of a million yeah. dollars, that's a $40,000 difference. Yeah. If you're talking about in the aspect of tax brackets, just yeah. as, that's I mean, how much 4% means. So he's like, oh, 4%. Oh my, 4% is a lot. Yeah. yeah. But look what happens here real quick. I'll just show you this. Mm -hmm. What if you just get Uncle Sam out of the equation? You accumulate the same million dollars, get your same 7%, and your 70,000 will last you to age 89, 25 years. So how much income did you actually have? 1.7 million, right? 1.7 million, and how much income did you get over here? 1.8 million, but you had to accumulate 1.5 million mm -hmm. just to do that. Now, I, we can show you a way to accumulate less than a million, have more income than 70,000, and it lasts the rest of your life. Welcome, everybody, to MPI. Exactly, and this is something, and this is not a secret, the wealthiest sector in our nation's economy has been doing this for decades. They put billions of dollars a year into these plans. Billions. I mean, the, the wealthiest of the wealthy. One guy said to me, how come I've never heard anything like this before? 
And I said, well, that's because it's been reserved only for the ultra rich. There are investments that are recommended to the ultra rich and there are investments that are recommended to everybody else. My attitude is, what's good enough, if it's good for the rich, obviously there's something behind it that they know or else they wouldn't put money into it. You know, you gotta have a little savviness, I think, uh, to, to uh, you know, to have money in areas that are gonna insulate you from market losses and taxation. But these are not, these are not something that's brand new. It's been around for a long time. So that's why we wanted to bring it to your attention. But look at this, you could even accumulate 900,000, pull out 70 grand a year tax-free and the income stream lasts you to age 91. 900,000 over here, when it was a million, that income lasted you 14, 14 years. Let's Over talk here. about the trend we've been following too. What happens if OA happens with an MPI account? What's that? What happens if the market hits negative 38% and you're in an MPI account? That's a good, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it's just like investing in individual stocks. You know, you, when you in, in, invest in stocks, it's always good to have a stop loss. So this way, you know, that if if the market if the if the stock goes down to a certain point, you know already what your stop loss, what your loss provision was going to be, what your 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 breakout uh, exit strategy was going to be within in that stock. That's your stop loss. Well, with MPI, the stop loss is zero, so that means you cannot go below zero. So what it does is, for the first time, you could be in the market with a floor and a ceiling. So you're playing within a parameter of the market. And what you're doing is this. It's not just the fact that you're pre playing within a 0% floor and a cap of whatever that percentage rate is, but it's the fact that you're locking in that gain and then annual resetting itself to the next high point. So if you get 10%, market goes up 10, you get 10. Market goes up another 10, you get 10. Market goes down 20, you're locked in at the original high point that you were at. And if the market goes down again, you break even. And then when the market goes up, you're going up from the high point that you were at before the market went down. Had you been in the market, now you'd have to go and make that, that, that growth factor. You have to make up for that time that the market went down. You have to make up for that now. So now all of a sudden, market could do really well, but you're still playing catch up. And if the market doesn't rebound the way it needs to, now it may take you years to get to that point. And then when that happens, that's when inflation kicks in and, and that's when you feel the effects of that. So, you know, the opportunity cost is a lot more of a loss than you think. Even though you might have recovered your, your lost principal, you still lost out on the tremendous amount of money that money could have earned had you just had not lost it to begin with. So MPI just creates a stop loss provision within it and then continue allows you. See, it's not about high returns, Nathan. So I always tell people, high returns are, are, you know, they're great, but life is a marathon. And I told the client once, I says, you know what? You, you, got, you got some good investments here. This is the problem is they're all sprinters. You got no marathon runners here. You got this guy who's going to sprint real fast. This guy's going to sprint, but then they tire out at some point. Then they got to stop. And then they got to get, you know, get their energy levels up. And then they got, they sprint again. You need marathon runners. Marathon runners in your portfolio are just going to keep, they're going to keep going. They, they go with a strong pace. They are, the idea is to finish the race. You got to include that in your portfolio or else these high, you know, returns are not going to make much, uh, much of a significant difference. You would talk about uh, mutual funds too. You want to talk about when it is a sprint, when you're going into, you know, mutual fund, not mutual funds. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, mutual funds. Individual stocks, we can make that quick gain. Those little sprints we use as a reference, the sprint right there should be utilized to boost these marathon type accounts because that's what's going to compound the most in the long run. You know, you can make, you know, $20,000 on the stock market this year. You don't want to deplete the fund, but you can take 10,000 and move it into one of these other vehicles to help boost that marathon, boost your pace, essentially, right. you know, you know one mile per hour faster, you know, 
Um, exactly. So the key thing that we just saw is you, you brought up, you know, what if we could remove Uncle Sam from this, um, this illustration, see how much you'd have? Well, that's what you're doing with MPI, because what's the secret to MPI? Tax advantage. Well, exactly. Tax advantage, no capital gain tax, no ordinary income tax. You're actually off the tax grid. And it's the IRS know it exists. They, they know it. It's there. They are they they're totally for it. But just a lot of people just don't know about it. Or if they've heard about it, they say, why haven't I heard about it before? Hey, look, listen, the best investments in the world are the ones that you don't know nothing about. I mean, the ones that you know everything about, the ones that you hear about all the time, those are the ones that you really should be questioning more. You should be questioning it, you know? And when you look at your investments, don't look at it just based on the critical mass of money. Look at how that investment functions when you start withdrawing money. If the goal, if you're putting money away to withdraw income from it, then it makes sense to look at the investment from income. I can tell you now, I've shown people this. I asked them, has your financial advisor ever shown you anything like this? And they say, no. I mean, he shows the accounts and what they're invested in, but they never show it functioning, you know, in a, in a time frame. They never show that. It's like uh, saving up for your dream car for 40 years and you go to, you get it finally at age 65 and you go to drive it and it quits on you after 10 years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And by yeah. that point, it's too late. You know, it is what it is. So remember, there's, there's invest taxable, tax deferred, tax free. If you like tax free, then do you have money in the tax free environment? No. Okay. Well, then maybe you should start putting some funds in there because a 401k account or any tax deferred account is only as good as the time that you allow it to stay within that account. Meaning you got to preserve it because once you pull money out of that tax deferred account, that's it. All bets are lost. Mm -hmm. The loss is there. Once you pay the tax, you never get it back. If you lose money in the market, the market can always rebound. But when you lose money to taxes, one way or another, even if you do really well, with, this, with these investments. And here's one thing, I, I remember did a simulation once of a $2 million account and the, the money lasted their whole life, but the amount of money they had to pay in taxes just to get that income. I, in my mind, I thought to myself, yeah, you got your income, yeah, but you almost had to spend almost $700,000 just to put that money in your pocket. Hey, look, if you're okay with that, then that's fine. But if you want to see a better way, then see a better way. You know, look at the numbers. The numbers don't lie. The numbers, they are what they are. And remember, this is not even taking a one negative year. This is yep. linear return. What was it, Brandon? Uh, the best time to retire in the United States was 1960 to 1990, correct? Oh, uh, yeah. The best time to retire in the United States was 1969 to 1999 in that time segment. What's the worst time to have retired in history? Probably 1999 to 2010. <laughs> uh, the worst time to have retired in the United States would have been uh, from 1956 to 1975. Oh, well. 1956 to 1975. Bad. If you retired in that time frame, that would have been a bad time. Now, there were four negative years uh, in the market, six, uh, 17 positive, uh, but still based on what the market did over the last 86 years, that was actually the worst uh, 20 year period. And, and the actual return was 7.06%, but it just, the, if you, I ran a simulation in that time frame, and the income just ran out very quickly, you know? So you had two negative years in, in a row, uh, 74, I'm sorry, 73 and 74, uh, but they were followed by two double digit returns the very following year. That's the other thing you'll find too, with MPI, what I like about it is that it, it, it automatically creates that stop loss for you. You don't have to consciously call up your broker and say, yeah, I want a stop loss that, you know, if it hits less than $25 a share, sell. You know, it automatically defaults to put that stop loss in your, in your, in your uh, account. So it's stress-free. It's simple. It's easy. You know, people want to just do what they want to do in their lives and know that, hey, my money is growing and compounding and I've covered a lot of bases. And when you have something like this in your portfolio, you can take more risk with other outside investments. 
Absolutely. It gives you leverage to be able to dip your toes in with having the stress of coming in, you know, with the money coming out of pocket, because you're, it's like an MPI accounts, like a savings account that's in the stock market. And I'm just kind of close this up with some fi- final thoughts for me, my whole, my overall summary. So when you open up an MPI accounts, you know, say now that you have this advantage at age 20, it, you have access to that unlike a 401k at any time. And it's tax-free loans to yourself. You can pay yourself back. If not, it comes out of the death benefit at the end. But the money is accessible any day, Monday through Friday. So if you're able to put $500, $1,000 into a savings account a month, there's no reason half of that wouldn't idealistically go into one of these accounts. Because if you needed it, say, you know, oh, gosh, my car took a crap on me. And I need 20 grand. I got 150000 in that account. I'm age 28. I can take that money out. I can take 20000 buy a car cash, brand, you know, Good new set of wheels, no penalty to me. I'm still participating in the market. And I just want to add some debunks to this. I love Dave Ramsey as far as what he's done for the financial, you know, aspect of the everyday person. But this man does not understand how life insurance contracts work. And if you're talking about this, you know, Dave, this is a Dave Ramsey setup, get a million dollars for retirement. Why would you advocate? for something that you know does not work for a, the guaranteed amount of time someone's going to live. If you're going to live to 90, why are you why are you pressing one avenue, one leg of retirement and then you know it's not going to work. And because I just there's there's some stipulation out there about MPI accounts, I just want to bring them up with you Brandon because I know you feel the same way. It's like comparing every car out there to a Toyota Corolla. They're all different. They're all, some are better over here, no matter what. If you have a mutual fund or a IRA poorly set up, it's going to perform poorly. So the key is when you're dealing with these insurance base, life insurance trusts, you, it has to be structured properly. And that's what you have to have a professional to do it. And they just don't understand because we hear about fees and we'll cover everything you need to know about MPI account in another video. But this is just a basic summary. Number one. It's interesting. How could you judge a suit when the suit is designed for it to be custom made for you? I I can't. How could I judge, you know, something on that you have if that item was is supposed to be custom designed for you? You know, I mean, it just doesn't. The logic's not there. Look, there's some assets that I'm not too fond of, but hey, if somebody says they're valid. Good. Show me the numbers. Give me a simulation. I love to be wrong. I love to be wrong because when I'm wrong, I learn something. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Oh, okay. That's, that's interesting. You know, now I'm more informed. I, the, this notion of uh, these advisors just being so stuck in the dinosaur period of <laughs> dollar cost. I mean, look, the, the mantra is fine. I got no problem with it, but we're living in a, this is the 21st century. We're living in a different environment. People are living longer. The markets are more volatile. Information spreads a lot faster than it did in the 80s and the 90s. I don't even like using simulations of the 80s and 90s anymore because it's not practical to use that going forward because that's not going to happen again. You know, we have the internet, we have technology that we didn't have in the 80s and 90s. So to kind of go back to the 80s and 90s to, to show a return that you're going to be getting when it's 2035, still using the 80s and the 90s, I just don't think that that's accurate. I like to start from at least 2000, go forward, because that's going to be a little more accurate the times that we're living in now. Absolutely. Everything has changed over time and gotten better. Everything, your phone, your car, screwdrivers, everything you can think of, you need to People just need to get their head out of the old way. Like, oh, this is how my grandparents did it. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, that's not how things are anymore. If you drove the same car yeah. your grandparents did, you'd be a little bit upset. I mean, unless it's a collectible one, then that's a yeah. different, different argument. But that doesn't work for IRAs and investment accounts. So the no. one you said something that, uh, you know, one of the first podcasts I ever hear you say, math doesn't lie. And it doesn't. Right. The only person right. holding you back, if I sit in front of you and show you a full plan with all the math that checks out and you don't decide to, you know, you don't want it, that's, that's your fault because you have to accept the fact that things change and there are better things out there. We hear mm-hmm. all the time, sounds too good to be true. How can they even make any money off of this? 
So we'll <laughs> tell you guys that in later episodes. That's right. That's Sometime. right. Yeah. Do you want to be transparency? We're gonna look go, at Bitcoin. Gonna open up the box. My best thing. Look at Bitcoin. Oh, it'll never take off. Crypto will be nothing. It's worth fifty thousand plus dollars now. How do you feel about that? There you, <laughs> you go. Know, there you, you go. Have a, and hey, how about account. how about this, Nathan? How about investing in crypto? And even if the crypto goes negative, the money that you invested in crypto, you never lost it because you used safe, positive leverage. How about that? All how about investing in something that's speculative, but you know you covered your bets? It's, All things that we will discuss on this podcast. I know, I know. Counts you've never continued. even heard of. Yeah, to be All continued, right. yeah. I love it, awesome. So to bring up, right before we close here, to my family member I spoke to the other day briefly, if you're looking for an account that the U.S. government cannot touch, cannot leverage over, you cannot change, you have to have an MPI, Life Insurance Based Trust Account, because it's protected by insurance law. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Good deal. All right. All right, buddy. Any you closing points you got before uh, you want to close this thing out? Yeah. You know what? Just uh, be informed. Information is the currency of the 21st century. And the information is out there. There's no excuse. I mean, it's all there. So learn ideas, but also question those ideas. Ask why. And always look at liquidity, safety, rate of return, tax advantages, fees. Always get the answers to those five questions. But look at the numbers, not just based on a critical mass, but also how that critical mass functions when income starts to disperse from that critical mass. Because that tells the truth about what kind of investment you really had the entire time you were funding it. That's the episode. Yes. The truth the about truth. your IRA. <laughs> the truth. All right, guys. I'm going to close this down for us. Thanks again, Brandon, for coming on the Oracle yeah. of All Things Finance. Um, you know, we're, we just got the YouTube page up and running. If you can hit us with a subscribe, a like, anything means a lot. We're trying to grow this channel, you know, really actually make a difference and impact people on a day to day basis, help them out and get them this information. Make a difference because I, I knew, you know, you're, you know, older in the market. I'm brand new to it and we both cannot stand the way that it is dealt with right now is on an everyday yeah. basis. So this is a revolution. Got our Twitch channel, Beyond Wall Street. Give a follow. We are going live and working on getting better at my broadcasting skills so I can present these live. If you jump in Good, those chats, man. ask us a question. I got the chat up. But other than that, this has been your second episode of the awesome. weekly Beyond Wall Street podcast. Um, host Nathan Bowers and Brandon Nieves, and uh, we'll sign off here. All right. See you guys. All right. See ya.